a government based on proportional representation would have been ratified by New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, but maybe none of the other states, certainly none of the medium or small states. It was Sherman, of course, who came up with the Connecticut Compromise, who said, OK, let's have proportional representation in the House of Representatives and equal representation of the states in the Senate. This was a compromise. This is classic Sherman. Nobody gets everything he wants. The large states get proportional representation in the House. The small states get equal representation in the Senate. And this made the Constitution palatable to all states. Hi, this is Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at BRI, and we're pleased to bring you another episode of Scholar Talks. For this episode, we're honored to have on scholar Mark Hall, who is going to discuss his book, Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic as part of our American Founder series. The guiding question for this series is what core contribution did this founder make to liberty and constitutional self-governance? Now, Mark David Hall is Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics at George Fox University. He is also Associated Faculty at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University and a Senior Fellow at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion. He's currently a visiting fellow at Princeton University's James Madison program and a visiting scholar at the Mercatus Center. Now, Mark has written or edited about a dozen books, most of which I read, uh, including the forthcoming Proclaim Liberty Throughout the Land, How Christianity Has Advanced Freedom and Equality for All Americans, and his most recent book was Did America Have a Christian Founding? Separating Modern Myth from Historical Truth. Mark, I want to thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Tony. Yeah, great. Yeah, I've really enjoyed your books uh, over the years. Um, a lot of them have been on sort of the founding and religion and, and the relationship of, of government and religion. Uh, and, and I've really benefited and profited from them. But I wanted to come back to an earlier book you wrote on Roger Sherman uh, as part of this series because you know, he's, he's really just a, a lesser known figure, but such an important statesman during the founding. Uh, and, and I definitely wanted to include uh, Sherman as sort of a forgotten founder. And when, when most Americans, you know, think of the founders, a handful of men come to mind, right? Uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin several of whom I've written about, but, but Roger Sherman is seldom mentioned. So, so who is he and you know, why is he important? Sure, no, that's a great question. So the men you mentioned, of course, are indisputably great Americans, great founders, and they, they must be studied. And yet, if we want to understand the founding generation, we have to go beyond this, this handful or five or six um, excellent, important founders and look at the broader constellation of founders. And some, of course, are more influential than others. But as you've already suggested, Sherman was enormously influential. So he comes from a lower middle class background. His father was a farmer, uh, grew up in Massachusetts, moved to Connecticut. He, he never went to college. He was a cobbler, taught himself mathematics. He became a, a maker of almanacs, eventually apprenticed in the law. In the 1750s, he became involved in state politics. He was an early advocate of independence, and eventually he became involved in almost every important major national document. He was the only founder to sign the Declaration of Resolves, the Articles of Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the U.S. Constitution, and was involved in framing the Bill of Rights. And not only did he sign many of these documents, he was intimately involved in framing them. And we can perhaps talk about some of the details later. I also want to point out, if you think about the, um, the, the handful of founders you mentioned, all of them, except for John Adams, are members of the Church of England, usually lifelong members of the Church of England, or towards the end of their lives, they joined that church, also known as the Anglican Church. Only about 15% of Americans are Anglicans. 50 to 75% are Calvinists or members of the Reformed tradition, and so these um, many Americans are completely unrepresented in this small sample, although they're represented a little bit, perhaps by John Adams. Someone like Sherman is a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist. And so one of the things I try to do in my book is use him to shine, not shine a light on these 50 to 75% of Americans who are Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Dutch Reformed, 
and members of other reformed churches. Right, uh, that tees up my next question perfectly, actually. Uh, th this dissenting uh, resistance tradition uh, in, in the Calvinist uh, and, and, and other denominations, um, you know, really plays in a very important role in the founding and is really consistent in many ways with the founding. So what do you mean by, by that reform tradition and why is it relevant to, to the founding and, and even consistent with those constitutional or founding uh, Lockean principles? Oh, well, that's a great question. I, I think far too many people who work on the American founding, especially political scientists, historians aren't quite as guilty of this, just draw an immediate straight line from John Locke to the American founders and, and argue that we had a secularized Lockean founding. Whereas I think Protestantism broadly explains a lot of what's going on here. So you think about some of the battle cries of the Protestant Reformation, Sola, Sola Scriptura, the priesthood of all believers, the um, salvation through faith alone. Um, these things led to the development of, of practices and habits, widespread literacy. If you really believe that all truth comes from the Bible and everyone is responsible for knowing that truth for himself or even herself, then it only follows that you need widespread literacy. And this is exactly what you see in Protestant countries. As well, um, Protestantism breaks down the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. All individuals have direct access to God. And what you see in Protestant countries is a, a flattening of political structures. Nowhere do you see this more than in Protestant New England, Calvinist New England, right? Where, you know, from the get-go, these folks are having semi-annual elections. Almost every white male can vote. Um, you have the rule of law, written laws, and this sort of thing as well. And I think incredibly important, within the Christian tradition prior to the Protestant Reformation, you have an occasional Catholic scholar who, who talks about the doctrine of tyrannicide. It never really goes much of anywhere. The Protestants, again, almost from the beginning, John Calvin talks about inferior magistrates having the duty to resist a superior magistrate who becomes a tyrant. Um, even as he's making that argument, John Knox is, is saying, no, the people themselves have a duty to resist um, tyrants. The author of Wendicia Contras Tyrannos articulates well almost every doctrine we associate with John Locke. The idea that individuals have natural rights, that government must be by the consent of the governed, that tyrants must be resisted. And he does so more than 50 years before Locke writes the second treaties. And so part of my argument is within Protestantism and specifically within Calvinism, you have this, these deeply ingrained ideas that I think go on to play such an important part in America's war for independence and the creation of our constitutional order. All right, well... You've told me we, we need to take a more expansive view of sort of the, the influences uh, on, on the founders, right? Not just sort of in the Enlightenment Lockeanism. Lockeanism. So, uh, but let's focus in on, on some of uh, Sherman's specific contributions, uh, particularly, uh, you know, he's on the, the committee for drafting the, the declaration and, and supports American independence. Uh, so why does he support a, American independence and, and what are his major contributions in, as you mentioned, both state and national politics? And I think we can push it back to the Stamp Act crisis, right? So as early as 1764, 1765, Sherman, John Adams, and a few others are just absolutely convinced that Americans have no obligation to obey parliament whatsoever. The connection is to the crown. And so when parliament starts taxing Americans without their consent, these Americans say, no way, this is unconstitutional. This is a path towards tyranny. And so from the get-go, um, Roger Sherman's is right side by side by at, with that John Adams and Samuel Adams and others in resisting this. Now, parliament, of course, eventually backs up and, and repeals the Stamp Act. But then it very imprudently, 1766, passes the Declaratory Act, which in, a cent, in essence says Parliament has no limitations on its power whatsoever. And to Calvinists, this is the definition of tyranny, right? So Sherman continues to be involved in this resistance. He's elected the first Continental Congress, the second Continental Congress, as you point out. He's appointed to the five-person, the five-man committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Unfortunately for his future fame, he is far more important in 1776 than a John Adams or John Dickinson or some of these other people we know better. And so he's also, also appointed in the same year to the committee to draft the Articles of Confederation and the Board of War, which I think anyone would have told you is the most important congressional committee. Thomas Jefferson, by way of contrast, is appointed only 
to the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. And so the bulk of the work falls to him. It's probably a good thing. Sherman never went to college. He's nowhere near as eloquent as a Thomas Jefferson. So I'm not trying to take anything away from Jefferson. I just want to point out that if you were to walk into Congress in 1776 and say, who matters here? People would be pointing towards Roger Sherman and not Thomas Jefferson. He does participate in this committee of five. Um, Congress, of course, revamps Jefferson's draft. And I think this is important because we're sometimes tempted to read the Declaration of Independence in light of Thomas Jefferson's private views, views that he was very careful to keep from the public. And I think we have to view it as a public document. So in interpreting the Declaration of Independence, we need to look to what these this five member committee understood the words to be, and then more broadly, what Congress understood the words to be. Sherman continues to serve in the Continental and the Confederation Congresses. He serves more than, I think, only five Four people serve more than him. So he's involved at every stage of the, the War for American Independence, working very hard to find provisions for George Washington's army, um, eventually votes to approve and he signs the Treaty of Paris, and then he steps away from, from national politics, at least for a short time. Right, and, and is involved in, in local state politics. I mean, we often sort of forget that, or maybe we don't think it's quite as important, but there was a lot of important things going on in the state. And I, I think it was involved in, in revising the legal code. In, well, that's exactly know. right. The separation of powers was just not understood at all as we understand it today. So even just serving in Connecticut politics, he was initially in the lower house, then the upper house. And he, as he was in the upper house, he was also in the superior court of Connecticut. So simultaneously serving in a legislative and a judicial function. And then when he was appointed to the, the, the Continental Congress, he continued to serve in, this capa in these capacities. In 1783, he and the aptly named Richard Law are asked to revise all of Connecticut statutes. So sort of like Thomas Jefferson did down in Virginia, um, Richard Law and, Tom and Roger Sherman did in Connecticut. Uh, we could point to a number of interesting statutes. I'll just point to two. Jefferson, of course, is well known for his famous religious liberty statute. Roger Sherman framed one as well, 1783, a religious liberty statute for Connecticut. And I, I, and I think this must be considered if we're really interested in the founders' understanding of religious liberty and church-state relations. We can't just look to Thomas Jefferson's Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty. We have to look to Roger Sherman's Connecticut Statute, Abraham Baldwin's Statute down in Georgia, and elsewhere. Every state passed religious liberty statutes. But I want to uh, highlight one others. One other. Um, today, it's very popular to talk about the founders and slavery and how we must reject America's founders because they own slaves. And in fact, in um, the famous founders you mentioned, all of them, except for John Adams, owned slaves at one point of their lives or another. Now, many of them came to repudiate the institution. They freed their slaves. I think it's important to note as well, though, that there are plenty of founders like Roger Sherman, Oliver Ellsworth, and many of these Calvinists from New England who never owned an enslaved person. And in fact, Richard Law and Roger Sherman in revising Connecticut statutes passed, they came up with, and the legislature approved a gradual manumission law that put slavery on the road to extinction in Connecticut, as did eight of the northern states between 1776 and 1806. So it's important to recognize that a lot of founders understood the grave evil that was slavery and took practical steps to end it. Sherman is one of those founders. Right, right. Uh, very, yeah, very important. I, I, I was just chuckling because the, he just was involved in so much. And we saw, we're still not even at the Constitutional Convention yet. So, uh, and, and he was, in fact, a, a delegate to the Federal Convention. Uh, and, and what were his goals there? And, and what were his major contributions? I mean, as you point out in the book, he spoke a lot and was really involved in, in, the, in the core debates. So what were his goals and contributions? So Sherman understood from his many years of service in the national government that the national government needed to be strengthened. It needed to be able to raise revenue. It needed to be able to regulate interstate commerce. It needed to be able to field an army when necessary. He was not a fan of standing armies, but if threatened by France or England, we needed to be able to come up with a, a plausible um, national army. He arrived at the convention a few days late. Madison had already presented his Virginia plan. The Virginia plan, if you step back and think about it, um, was, was 
very ambitious, right? The Virginia plan was completely based on proportional representation. So the large states would have had the lion's share of the power. The Virginia plan would have given the national government basically plenary power, the power to do whatever it saw fit. Sherman shows up and he says, in effect, you have got to be kidding me. This is a recipe for disaster. First of all, this proportional representation stuff, um, a government based on that will never be ratified, a constitution based on that by most of the states. But to give the national government unlimited power, that's crazy. And so he proposed in almost his first act there what became eventually Article 1, Section 8. He said we should enumerate the powers of the national government. Um, to regulate interstate commerce, to pass a tax, to raise an, arm, an army. Um, we should be very clear in what the national government does, and everything else should be left to the states. To the extent to which governments should do things like punish crimes and help the poor and educate children, this is something that should be done at the state level, not the national government. And so he and Madison fought back and forth on these questions throughout the entire summer of 1787. Sherman was terrified of concentrated power in the executive branch. And so as Hamilton and Wilson and Madison pushed for a strong executive, Sherman fought back at every step and he lost many of those battles. And we could keep going on issue by issue. Um, a, a political scientist a few years ago did a study um, and, uh, and, and he looked at where Madison and Sherman disagree. Now, they did agree on a number of things, right? But where they disagreed, Sherman actually won more of the battles than Madison. Um, Jack Rakoff, the very, um, the very good historian, I disagree with him on some points, but he's an excellent historian, has pointed out that it was a dynamic between Sherman and Madison that made the Constitution so successful. Again, I, I don't want to take anything from Madison, but think about it, a government based on proportional representation would have been ratified by New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, but maybe none of the other states, certainly none of the medium or small states. It was Sherman, of course, who came up with the Connecticut Compromise, who said, okay, let's have proportional representation in the House of Representatives and equal representation of the states in the Senate. This was a compromise. This is classic Sherman. Nobody gets everything he wants. The large states get proportional representation in the House. The small states get equal representation in the Senate. And this made the constitutional palatable, the Constitution palatable to all states. Um, let me do point out, uh, again, I don't want to paint him as some um, enormously influential founder who won every battle. He lost a lot of the battles with respect to the presidency. He wanted the president to be elected by the legislative branch every single year. He wanted the legislative, later, legislative branch to be, be able to declare war and to make war. He wanted a very weak president, in other words, and he lost many of those battles. And you know we can evaluate, is it a good thing he lost or a bad thing? You know, personally, I think that we've entrusted far too much power in the executive branch. And certainly the executive branch has come to assume so much power, too much power in the 20th, 21st century. And if Sherman had won those battles, um, we might be better, better off. But again, the, the constitution is a product of the community. And if we have to call any founder the father of the constitution, it should probably be Madison. But we have to understand that Madison was not a demigod among men who are just cowed by his brilliance, right? People resisted him, people fought him, and the Constitution is a product of a community, and thank goodness it was. I, I think that's why the document has served us so well to the present day. Right, and, and uh, you know, thinking a couple years after the convention, I found it very intriguing, reading through uh, Roger Sherman and the creation of the American Republic, your book, that despite his fear of executive power and even to some degree sort of a, you know, a very expansive national power as well, that, that he, I, Sherman actually supported uh, uh, Hamilton's financial plans, which, which I've written a lot about. And, and he also interestingly opposed the Bill of Rights, uh, much like Madison, uh, but then became one of its main proponents in, in the first Congress. So Tell us a little bit about his his service in, in the new republic in that new national government. Sure. So um, so Sherman, just, just to connect the convention to his service in, in the new Congress, Sherman went from the federal convention to Connecticut's ratifying convention. Connecticut was the only state that had its all the delegates from the federal convention go to the state ratification convention. Um, Sherman, Ellsworth, and Johnson um, dominated the convention. Connecticut became the fifth state to ratify the Constitution. Um, Connecticut then chose Johnson and Ellsworth to be senators. 
and Sherman was elected as a member of the House of Representatives. And so he showed up in New York where the first federal Congress was meeting and played a very important role in a number of events. Um, one of the profound ironies, and you're exactly right, uh, Madison um, was arguing for extensive national power in the convention. Sherman was fighting it at every step. By the time you get to the first federal Congress, all of a sudden here, now you have uh, Madison opposing Hamilton's bank plan and Sherman uh, supporting it, right? And so I, I think both of these politicians are principled men, but they're also prudential men, right? And so their, their views might change over time and um, in a particular specific context. Um, Sherman also um, continued to oppose executive power um, in an early debate. There was a question, okay, the president gets to appoint cabinet secretaries. Um, can he simply fire those cabinet secretaries or does the Senate have to approve firing? them? Sherman argued that the Senate has to confirm them, so the Senate should have to um, uh, uh, approve firing them. Um, the Congress disagreed and, and Sherman lost on that battle. The Bill of Rights, I, I think, is fascinating. So the Federalist line, which I think is fair, is that a Bill of Rights is simply not necessary. James Wilson argued this, Madison argued this, Sherman argued this. The federal government is one of enumerated powers. Congress simply does not have the power to respond the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, to establish a national church. And so therefore, we don't need a Bill of Rights specifying that Congress can't do these things. James Madison, of course, failed in his attempt to get appointed senator from Virginia. Um, he It was not crystal clear he would be elected um, to the House of Representatives until he promised the Baptists in Virginia that he would pursue and advocate for a Bill of Rights. And so I think he felt an obligation to do so in corresponding with the Bill of Rights with Thomas Jefferson and Jeff Madison explained why it wasn't necessary, why it might even be dangerous. What if we leave some rights out? It might be assumed that they aren't protected. Thomas Jefferson said in effect, yeah, but it won't hurt anything. And so Madison sure enough is one of the first advocates for a Bill of Rights. Um, he's opposed by Sherman, but the art reason Sherman art gives is, look, we have more important things to do. We have to create a federal judiciary. We have to create an executive branch. This Bill of Rights that really isn't necessary can wait. But nonetheless, um, Madison is persistent, and eventually the House of Representatives begins considering a Bill of Rights. Um, let me here take a step back and, and connect to your very first question. I, I've done a lot of work on the First Amendment, especially the um, the religion clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, here's where I think a lot of scholars and jurists really distort the founders' views. Scholar after scholar, jurist after jurist, look simply and only to James Madison and Thomas Jefferson to help us understand the founders' views. One of the themes of all of my books has been that we have to look beyond Jefferson and Madison. Um, these folks are very important, but they are not representative founders. And again, they were not demigods, simply imposing their private views upon the rest of Americans. And I think we can see this well with respect to the religion clauses um, if we look at the path of the Bill of Rights through the House of Representatives. So Madison uh, gets Congress finally to consider the many amendments that were proposed by state ratification conventions and by minorities. There were something like 124 different amendments that were proposed. A committee was put together in the House to consider which of all these amendments should we actually take seriously. This committee was composed of one member from each state. Madison was on that committee, so was Sherman. This committee met and hashed things out. The only handwritten draft of the Bill of Rights that we have is in Roger Sherman's hand. And I think this shows he was at least an active participant. Eventually a printed version of this committee's report came to the House and there was discussion. Every single amendment that Madison proposed was, was altered in some way or the other. There was one amendment that would have restricted the abilities of the states to violate the rights of its citizens. Madison said, this is the most important amendment of all, and it was rejected completely, right? That's why it's not in the Bill of Rights to this present day. And so again, Sherman is involved. Madison wanted the amendments put in the text of the Constitution. Madison said, no, we, or Sherman, I'm sorry, said, no, we can't do that. We should put the, the amendments at the end of the Constitution. Sherman obviously won that battle, right? That's why we have the Bill of Rights. Um, attached to the Constitution, not interspersed in the Constitution. Um, just as today, the House 
debated what the Bill of Rights should contain. The Senate debated it. Eventually, a conference committee was put together, three members from the House, three members from the Senate. Madison, sure enough, headed the conference committee from the House, but Sherman was on that committee. The Senate committee was chaired by Oliver Ellsworth whom Roger Sherman was a mentor of, right? Oliver Ellsworth is another old Calvinist and old Puritan from Connecticut. And eventually the, um, the committee agreed on the final wording that went back to the House, went back to the Senate and was approved and sent to the states. And of course, as you know, 12 amendments sent to the states, 10 approved by the states. And so the Bill of Rights has 10 amendments, one not approved at all and one approved much, much later. And my point here is not to take anything away from Madison is just simply to emphasize that if we want to understand the original understanding and what the First Amendment was originally understood to do, we cannot just look real carefully at, at James Madison or Thomas Jefferson. And, and we should note that Jefferson played no role in drafting and ratifying the Bill of Rights. He was over in Europe at the time. We need instead to consider a wider constellation of founders. And this constellation certainly must include someone like Roger Sherman, who actually played an intimate role in drafting the Bill of Rights. Right. Uh, well, Sherman's obviously an important founder. Uh, so my, my final question uh, is, is why is he not better known today? Why is he a forgotten founder? I, I think that's a great question. And one thing I would point you to is you consider what the founders we know have in common. With one exception, all of them were relatively young men in 1776. All of them lived to play important roles in the new national government, usually in the executive branch, right? So the five or six you mentioned, four became presidents of the United States, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. It's easy to do sort of, um, I don't know, noteworthy things as president of the United States. It's a lot harder to do those sorts of things as a member of the House of Representatives, as a member of the Senate. Ben Franklin, of course, is the one exception to that rule. He's a relatively old man in 1776, and he doesn't play an important role in the new national government, uh, but he has so many other accomplishments. He makes everyone's list, I think. Alexander Hamilton, of course, didn't become president, but played a, a critically important and, and brilliant role in, in the national government in the executive branch again. Again, Sherman's a relatively old man. He is the second oldest person in the federal convention, only Ben Franklin is older. He is literally the oldest person in the first House of Representatives, and he dies in 1793. So although he plays an important role in the new national government, he dies pretty early on. Um, a, a real practical reason is historians, students of history need papers to work with. Um, the, the papers of John Adams, the papers of George Washington, the papers of Thomas Jefferson, as you know, you know, they're multi-volume collections. They go on for dozens and dozens of volumes. Um, I actually edited a version of Roger Sherman's papers. Um, there's a one, it's a one volume edition published by Liberty Fund Press. And that really contains everything of interest. There's, you know, I didn't leave out interesting things. And so there's just simply not the paper trail to work with. And I think that hurts some founders in the same way that it hurts someone like a George George Mason or Patrick Henry. And then finally, I think there's a proclivity of scholars in the 20th and the 21st century to find maybe the more progressive founder, someone like a Thomas Jefferson, right? Who has very progressive ideas with respect to religion and politics and freedom of speech. Um, and so it's tempting to dismiss someone like a Roger Sherman who's relatively conservative on these matters. And they want to more or less pretend that people like Roger Sherman, Patrick Henry, John, Jay and others, the vast majority of founders, in fact, that, that they simply did not exist. Mark Hall, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us and for uh, educating us about the importance of Roger Sherman. Thank you very much for having me, Tony. It's been my pleasure. Right. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Please check out our other interviews in the series on the American founders, including Jay Cost on Madison, Jeff Morrison on George Washington, Thomas Kidd on Thomas Jefferson, Jonathan Den Hartog on John Jay, and several others. And check out BRI resources on the founding, including Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, and our updated Being an American. Thank you.